Welcome everyone. Whoops. All right. Sorry. There's that lady again. She always does that to me. Um, welcome everyone to Berkshire Ollie's Spring Community Open House in this very unspring like day. I was out shopping early this morning and it was cold even for the Berkshires. Um, so I hope I'm finding all of you in some nice warm place right now. Um, while we're all eager to hear what our wonderful lecturers have in store for us, I just wanted to take a few moments to speak to those of you who are new to Ali or who may be contemplating joining. And the one point I always like to make is that when you join Ali, you're not just joining the community. I, I mean, <laughs> oh dear. You're not just joining an organization. You're joining a community of lifelong learners. So if you're here today as a new member, I wanna welcome you to the Ali community. And if you're here contemplating membership, I hope that we do get to welcome you as a new member. Um, another thing that I would like to say to everyone is that we are very much a volunteer driven organization. I always think of our membership, which is over 1300 people strong at this point, as our greatest asset. When you think of all the life experience that we all bring to our Ali. Um, and I ask that each of you look for a way to become somehow involved in some sort of volunteering for Ali. And it could be everything from becoming one of our lecturers and you do not have to have had a career in academia in order to become an Ali lecturer, to just raising your hand occasionally to perhaps help at an event, uh, to doing committee work, chairing a committee, writing articles for our in-house newsletter, the Ali Update. There are so many wonderful ways to get involved as a volunteer for Ali. We need you, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, it's really a wonderful way to become truly integrated into the Ali community. Um, so, you know, please give it some serious thought. We have a wonderful volunteer coordinator, Shelly Sturman. If you'd like to get involved, but you're not quite sure where you'd fit in, um, contact the Ali office. We'll get you in contact with Shelly. Shelly is a board member. She's the co-chair of our arts curriculum committee. She's a co-chair of our art show committee. Um, so she's one of the best people you can speak to about becoming more and more involved in Ali. And we hope you'll give it some serious consideration. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that while we are, of course, primarily a lifelong learning institute, and so our five semesters of courses are a primary concern, there are many, many other opportunities here at Ali. Uh, one is our shared interest groups. For you new people, you'll hear people discuss our SIGs. Those are our shared interest groups. And what we do is we facilitate groups of Ali members getting together who share an interest, a passion, a hobby, a curiosity, and we just help the group to form. And then it's up to the members of that particular SIG as to when they meet, what they do, how often they meet. Um, they've been growing in number over the years. And here too, we have a SIG coordinator, that's Monica Sinclair. Monica is also a board member. She's the co-chair of our membership committee. She leads our French conversation SIG. So once again, she's a great person to speak to and um, she can certainly get you started. If you don't see a SIG, I think all our current SIGs are listed on our website. And you've got a great idea for forming one, give Megan a call and um, she'll get you set up and on the way. Um, we're always looking for um, more SIG leaders. So again, a wonderful way to get involved in Ali. Um, we also have a distinguished speakers series. Uh, a university day, special events, we have an annual art show. So there are just many, many ways to get involved in our Ali. 
We also have a wonderful mentorship program where we pair Ali mentors with mentee students from Berkshire Community College. Um, so again, an awful lot's always, always going on here at Ali, and we're always looking for new ideas. And just in closing, I want to talk a little little bit about what Ollie's going to look like post-COVID. Uh, many of you know that prior to COVID, we did everything in person. And of course, we got up one morning and it was a strange new world and we've been on Zoom exclusively since. But we're starting to finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm crossing my fingers. And we're starting to think about what Ollie's going to look like post-COVID. And what we know is it's going to be a mix of both in-person and Zoom classes and other opportunities. What that mix is going to be is to be determined. And we are all going to determine it together. We are going to fashion the future of our Ali together. So it's going to be a really, really exciting time. And I look forward on going through that process with all of you. And with that, I've completely blown through my allotted time. So I'm going to turn this over to the two co-chairs of our membership committee, our dynamic duo, that's Monica Sinclair and Ellen Quavier. I believe Ellen's going to speak first. So Ellen, take it away. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> what an introduction. Uh, the membership committee strives to make new Ali members feel welcome and old members feel valued. We host new member chats where guests get to introduce themselves and get to learn about Ali and about each other, who they might carpool with someday if they're local and who they might share their interests with if they're not. We also host all member chats, which are strictly social events uh, again, for members to get to know each other by breaking up into smaller groups in our chat rooms, at least for now. And we've used occasions such as the Lunar New Year, Mardi Gras, Valentine's, President's Day, all on the same weekend this year, as it turned out, to celebrate these holidays and the simple joy of being together. So if you're new to Ali or not, we hope you'll join us at our next chat. And with that, I turn it over to my wonderful co-chair, Monica. Thank you all. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I really, uh, Barbara stole my thunder, <laughs> but I can talk a little bit about the shared interest groups. As Barbara said, uh, this is a way for people with interests, um, not necessarily academic, to get together either physically or um, uh, on Zoom to continue and pursue those interests. And it can be anything from reading murder mystery books through to play reading, writing poetry, um, talking about um, uh, French conversation, uh, gender roles. Uh, there's a wide, wide range. I think we have over a dozen different shared interest groups at this point. Uh, I've put a link uh, in the chat to uh, the point on the website where you can find out more about the different uh, shared interest groups. Many of them are working very well in uh, during the Zoom era. Uh, you know, I can only speak to the French conversation group and the doing, doing it on Zoom gives you slightly lower quality croissant than meeting at a local cafe. But other than that, it works pretty well and everybody gets a chance to, to talk. So uh, as Barbara said, those are the existing shared interest groups. We're always happy to help somebody set up new shared interest groups. I have all sorts of ideas if anybody's interested and just doesn't know what they want to get involved in. Uh, we could do one on wine tasting, on cooking. We don't, we only have a French language group. I'm sure there are many, many people here in the Berkshires that speak other languages that would enjoy getting together for conversation. So the world is your oyster and it's a wonderful way to form a closer connection with people than maybe you can do in a, in a class environment because some of the people that you get to know through your shared interest group can turn out to be some of your closest friends going forward. Uh, and, and really, I can't tell you, uh, urge you strongly enough to, to think about getting involved in something like that. Apart from that, um, 
Ellen and I are here to answer any of your membership questions as if you think of them. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Megan to get back to the core of this uh, meeting, which is to hear from all the wonderful instructors we've got coming up. Thank you so much, Monica and Ellen and Barbara for uh, great introductions and information on all the really great ways to get involved with OLLI. The secret to OLLI's success and the quality of its programming is our members and volunteers themselves um, who teach classes, who develop classes, special events, um, and do so much uh, to make this the wonderful uh, learning community that it is. Um, it's my delight to welcome our spring instructors here today who are all, by the way, volunteers. They share their time and their insight and their knowledge with us. Um, and we are so grateful. The first one I'd like to introduce is Linda Halpern. Linda is moderating and curating a class called Changes We Hardly Noticed on Monday afternoons. She holds a BA from uh, Rutgers in political science and a master's degree in library uh, science, also from Rutgers. She's a member of the OLLI Social Science Curriculum Committee and the Literature Curriculum Committee and the former assistant editor of OLLI Updates. So please join me in welcoming Linda Halpern. Thank you, Megan, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's really my pleasure to talk a little bit about this course, Changes We Hardly Noticed. Um, the idea for this course actually came about through um, a conversation, a casual conversation that I was having with Ginny O'Leary. Ginny is the chairperson of our social science curriculum committee. Um, and we were just chatting about how when we were growing up decades ago, uh, things were different. Some things were different. And um, of course, lately we've all had shocking and sudden changes in our lives, but Ginny and I wanted to explore some of the cultural and societal changes and some of the changes in our civic organizations that have occurred over decades. And while none of us were really paying attention, these are the changes we hardly noticed. So we're going to explore over five sessions, uh, different areas um, such as schools, libraries, museums, um, with people who are experts in the field. We have five instructors. Um, each of them is an expert, as I said, in his or her field. We're starting on April 5th. All of our uh, sessions will be on Mondays from 1.30 to 3. On April 5th, we're starting with the topic of changes in language and communication. And our uh, instructor on that day is someone you may recognize if you've taken other OLLI courses, Stuart Edelstein. Um, then we move to April 12th, the following week. And again, we have a familiar instructor for OLLI. He's taught lovely courses for us before. Tom Garrity will be speaking about changes in higher education. On the 19th of April, we move to changes in food sources and preferences. Um, and that our instructor on that day is a name and a face known to many of you, Arlene Breskin. She's been a volunteer for Ali and done many wonderful things. She has a background in food and catering. The fourth session is April 26th. And on that day, we have a newcomer to Ali Craig Langlois, he um, is on the faculty, on the staff at Berkshire Museum. And he will be talking about changes in the role of museums in our communities. Finally, on May 5th, we are pleased to welcome Alex Ruskowski. Some of you may know him as the director of the Berkshire Athenaeum, who will speak about the role of public libraries and changes that have occurred in that area. So we have a lot to look forward to and um, hope to see you on Zoom at, uh, if not all, at least some of our sessions. Thanks for coming along.
Thank you so much, Linda. And we have a great question actually um, from Lisa. If classes are held on days or times when a person cannot attend live, are they recorded so they can be watched at a later time? And yes, unless our unless an instructor specifically requests that we not record a class, uh, we do do that, which means that if there is a, a class you'd like to take, um, that is at a time that doesn't work for you, then you can certainly sign up for it. And then each week just request that you get a link to the class recording. So that's one of those silver linings for, um, for our Zoom era. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Richard Maturo. Richard is a longtime beloved Ali instructor who has taught classes on Shakespeare, on Das Boot, on Lawrence of Arabia, and so much more. He holds a doctorate in English uh, literature in English with a specialization in Shakespeare and Greek mythology. After 16 years at the Albany Times Union, he taught literature at U University of Albany for 14 years. He's the author of many newspaper articles and six novels. And what he has done um, since we entered Zoom time um, in the quarantine is each semester he, um, he features one of his novels and reads it out loud to the class and then discusses it um, each week with them. So to me, I, that always sounds like the most relaxing class ever, as I always say, um, but um, and this uh, this spring semester is this the last in the series? Has it have we gone through all six books? Uh, no, oh. no. There's, there's one more. This is the fifth one. Oh, okay, wonderful. So this this for spring in, in on Tuesday afternoons is going to be a novel of his called Troy. Richard. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, I hope you don't get too relaxed. Most people don't know this, uh, but the Trojan War actually happened. I mean, Helen of Troy, the 10 year siege, the wooden horse, the burning of the city, everything. At least that's the impression I hope you get from reading, listening to my novel, Troy. Uh, it's the story as a modern novelist would tell it with uh, realism and characterization, uh, the characteristics you would expect in a contemporary narrative. Uh, as Megan said, uh, this is, well, this is my 11th year as an Ollie instructor, and in the past I have taught Shakespeare and Homer and Melville, but um, with the coming of the pandemic, I decided to do something different, especially since most of our entertainment venues disappeared. Um, because I'm a novelist and uh, have also been an actor, I've been doing a dramatic reading of one of my books each semester. I read the entire novel in six segments with time at the end of each class for a general discussion. It's sort of a cross between an audio book and a book discussion group with this difference. You have the author right there. So if there's something you like or dislike, um, you, you can get it off your chest right then and there. Uh, and I do encourage participants to be uh, as candid as they would like to be. Um, it's also a chance to discuss writing from the inside, uh, to get a writer's perspective on the novel and, and on the creative process. Now, Troy happens to be um, my very first novel. It was published in 1989. And uh, I'll just read you a, a brief blurb from the flyleaf. On a ship, several miles from shore, Helen watched the receding coastline and bade it farewell. She saw nothing pursuing her that day, only the invisible wind that filled the sails. Yet something was following. It followed her across the sea to Asia. It followed her into the great citadel of Troy. It followed her through the war. It followed her to her grave, in fact. And after she was dead, it followed her shade down the centuries. It was the word she could not flee. Beautiful. The course will be Tuesday afternoons at 3.30 to 5, beginning March 23rd, which is exactly three weeks from today, right now. Uh, by the way, I tell particip participants, 
that they don't need to sit at the computer the whole time. You can turn up the volume, move around, uh, have your afternoon tea or start your cocktail hour early, um, and you only need to come back for the discussion. Mainly it's time to relax and enjoy. I hope to see you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I, that always sounds like the best time. Um, I am now excited to welcome Marcus Johnson. Marcus is a uh, professor emeritus at Williams College and a geologist. Uh, he taught a class several years ago on the geology of Baja, California, and has written several books about this. And the class that he's teaching uh, this semester, Islands in Deep Time, is actually based on a forthcoming book that he is currently working on. He has a PhD in paleoecology from the University of Chicago and um, has um, broad interests in ge geology, past and present. Please welcome Marcus Johnson. Well, thank you, Megan, for uh, this introduction. You're exactly right. It was five years ago that I taught a course on the geology and ecology of Mexico's Baja California region, which is a very exciting place to, uh, to research and visit. And I was very happy to, to, to bring a lot of people along with me, some of whom actually went to Baja, Baja after the course and saw the place for, them, for themselves. Uh, indeed, one, uh, one of the dozen lectures that I'll be giving uh, will take us back to Baja California 160 million years ago to visit some Cretaceous islands that are exquisitely preserved on the west coast the Pacific coast uh, of the peninsula. But there are another dozen lectures that will deal with other places around the, the world from uh, Europe, other places in North America, including uh, Canada's Hudson Bay region, uh, places in Asia from Korea to China to Vietnam, uh, places in uh, Australia, a wonderful island uh, continent of, on, on its own account. Uh, Geologists are adept as time travelers. That's what, really what we do. And this course is sort of designed to, to take you to places where individual islands actually jump out of the landscape and face us uh, head on. They're so excellently preserved that we can see them uh, in three dimension and we can actually wander around. I'll be having a lot of slides, a lot of images from these places. We can wander around, around and actually experience what it's like to walk along the shores of these, of these islands. Now, at the same time, uh, these islands, while re relatively small in area, were fixed in a, uh, a, a, a paleocontinental situation that essentially represents a very different planet. If we go back 500 million years ago, for example, to the Cambrian of the Baraboo Hills in southern Wisconsin, we're visiting a place that uh, where North America was not where we find it today. In fact, it was sitting pretty close to the Paleo Equator, and uh, it, it was a continent that was flooded uh, very broadly by seas. Uh, perhaps only about 10% of the landmass of uh, of North America was actually above uh, water level at that particular time. So part of the course also will show some geographic reconstructions to put these paleo islands into uh, their, their global context. And the idea really is that not only are we doing time travel, but we're doing interplanetary travel. We're actually going back in time to visit a very different planet Earth than the one that exists today. Uh, so that's, that's part of the, the whole uh, uh, spirit of the course. Now, the first uh, lecture, which begins uh, in March 24th, um, starts right here in New England. And it's meant as a kind of a training exercise that will get us ready for our explorations in other places around, around the world. So it starts off in uh, Southern New Hampshire's Mount Monadnock State Park. And then it also goes to uh, the Marble Bridge uh, state park right here in neighboring uh, uh, North Adams. So this introduction will also give you a feeling for um, some of the geology here in New England before we launch off, for example, and go to the Baraboo Hills of Wisconsin, 
Black Hills of South Dakota, and even up to, uh, to Hudson Bay. Uh, an incredible place, uh, Churchill, uh, Manitoba, a place that I have done uh, a fair amount of research on. So why islands? Uh, why should this course focus on islands? Well, islands are relatively small. They're easy to grasp. Uh, it's not like exploring an entire continent. It's not like giving a course on the geology of North America or the geology of Australia. In other words, we're having small bite-sized pieces that are, are easy to see, easy to literally tour around. We're, we're taking a journey to these places, not only in the past, but we're actually walking around uh, these, these physical uh, objects. Uh, so the course is meant to answer some basic questions. For example, how is an island born? How does an island die? Uh, how does life find itself to an island that's isolated uh, from all other parts of the world? Uh, what kind of life, both terrestrial and marine life, actually uh, finds its way to, to isolated uh, islands? So this is, these are some of the main objectives that we're, we're going to try to achieve. Most importantly, I'm, I'm going to argue that islands are really the perfect metaphor for our own home planet, the blue planet, planet Earth, which is a very fragile island uh, in outer space. Uh, it's isolated as an outpost in, in outer space. Now, just last week, it's very exciting uh, that uh, NASA uh, landed its uh, rover Perseverance on our neighboring red planet, Mars. And the site that this rover has landed on is, is, is a very interesting place. In some ways, we can visualize it as uh, some, some parts of, of our own planet here. So indeed, we have launched ourselves now on uh, the whole idea of interplanetary travel. I'm, I have no doubt that sometime maybe uh, in, a, in a decade or two in the future, we will be sending uh, 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 humans to, uh, to, to land on Mars and maybe even to colonize uh, Mars. But what this course uh, offers is a more of an introspective uh, type of journey. It's a journey back in time to planets that were very different from our present day planet. But uh, indeed they, they represent a kind of a, a a notion of a fragile, an entire planet, planet Earth that is very fragile. And the course is meant to sort of encourage uh, a more pure, a better stewardship, that the kind of things we need to do to uh, really protect and, and better appreciate our own home planet. That's what I hope to do. And I hope you, some of you will join me uh, on, uh, on March uh, 24th for the introductory lecture to that course. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson. Um, every time I listen to these course descriptions, I want to take all of them. And it actually reminds me that although our, um, our instructors are all volunteers, one of the things we do offer them is the opportunity, opportunity to take a free class. So to, my, uh, to our spring instructors, I encourage you as you're listening to each other speak to think about which class you yourself might want to want to take and all you need to do is call us or email us and ask um, to be um, put on that list for that class and we will be happy to do so um, and somebody asked what time is professor johnson's class and that is uh, his class on wednesdays is 11 30 a.m to 1 p.m and again, if you are not available at that specific time or if you miss a class because of a doctor's appointment or possibly a vaccine shot, you can, um, you can just email us and we will send you the link to the recording. So no worries at all. And I am, our, our next person up is uh, Susan Wozniak, who's teaching a class on the sovereignty goddess, but I'm not sure that she's here. So unless she um, raises her hand, and we'll, we will move on to Hank 
Gold, who is teaching the, uh, or actually he, this class is not a talk class. This is a moderated class. Uh, we have two moderated um, discussion classes. One of them is on um, it, today's headlines, which is about current events, which has gotten a little, little slightly more relaxed than it has been over the past several years. Um, but they still have tons of stuff to talk about. Very popular class. Also very popular is our science conversations class. We used to do it just twice a year, but now we do it almost every semester, uh, thanks to our wonderful moderators like Hank Gold. And that class is where you have the opportunity to discuss the latest in scientific research and discoveries with a specific focus on the wonderful coverage in the New York Times every Tuesday. Um, and, and we have uh, rotating moderators for this class. And Hank is uh, one of the newest um, in, in, uh, in the history of science conversations and moderators. He's a retired radiologist with wide ranging interests. He actually videoed the most incredible video of an owl eating a smaller creature um, through the snow this morning. It was on Facebook. Um, so very interested in wildlife. He has a a uh, medical degree from Rush Medical College and undergraduate degree in biology from Columbia. Hank, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. I, I think it might have been a shrew. It was tough to tell what uh, it was being consumed. Uh, and you know, after that introduction from you, uh, there's <laughs> hardly much for me to say. Uh, you know, one of the things, and I appreciate uh, these other instructors going uh, in great detail about uh, the course material that they're gonna be presenting, um, but basically, uh, we have no uh, fit, uh, set format. Uh, we uh, discuss uh, topics that are discussed in the Tuesday Science Times, uh, Tuesday Science section of the New York Times. Um, and we meet on Fridays so that people have a chance to read the section and digest the, the articles. And then we basically have a... Uh, a free-flowing discussion of articles of interest. Uh, everyone gets a chance to, to participate uh, and offer their opinions. Zoom is just a wonderful format uh, for these discussions. Uh, people get to raise their hand and, and, and uh, uh, participate. And plus, uh, me as moderator, I get to see the names of everyone. So it, it makes it easier for me as well. Uh, anyhow, um, you know, I... I done this a couple of times now, and, and I love participating in, in the classes that uh, uh, Tony and Peter uh, moderate, and, and it really is a, a fine opportunity for people to, to discuss their opinions about things. Uh, many people are knowledgeable, have specific interests that they, they uh, uh, have, and, and, and there's a lot to be uh, uh, offered there. Anyhow, I'm looking forward to this next uh, semester, uh, and, and uh, I hope uh, everyone else feels as enthusiastic as I do. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Hank. And uh, there's a request to show the video, your video of the owl spread eagle on the snow eating the the uh, creek, the shrew. Um, so, but it looks like it's um. If you want to make it public on your Facebook page, we can share it with the world and maybe you'll get a million views. <laughs> it, it, it's actually, uh, I've posted it to YouTube uh, and, and while this class, this, this uh, uh, session is, is going on, I'll see if I can find the link and I'll put it up in the chat and you'll have it there. Perfect, yeah, it, it is pretty incredible. Uh, I wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. Thank you Thank so you, much. Megan. <laughs> Well, I was just, just luck, you know, because, you know, it was right through my window uh, and there was this owl having a meal. It was great. Yeah, <laughs> that's the Berkshires for you. Thank it you. Is. Thank you. Well, now I am delighted to welcome Susan Wozniak. She had the perfect excuse for not being here when I was first looking for her. She was reading and lost track of time, which is a true Ollie uh, reason for missing something because we all love to learn and to read. Susan is teaching a fascinating class called the Sovereignty Goddess. Um, let's see, and that is 
when is that? That's uh, Wednesday afternoons. She has a master's degree in Celtic studies, magna cum laude from Harvard University. She's presently retired and is a former adjunct professor and working journalist. Welcome so much, Susan. Hi, Megan, sorry about that. I thought, oh, it must be two o'clock now. And I looked up and it was four. Um, uh, the sovereignty goddess, um, she is almost exclusively a, an Irish or Welsh figure. And yet she has her roots in, in Indo-European languages and the people who spoke them. And I got interested in uh, Celtic matters because I had children who loved reading uh, alternate history and science fiction and myth. So I decided to write a book on who the real Arthur was. And after a year of research, I didn't know any more than when I started and decided to take a class in Celtic studies. And that was the beginning. Um, in this class, we're going to examine um, several important texts and Irish texts are some of the oldest literature in Europe. Uh, and they began as oral stories. In fact, they were always performance art. And what I would like to do is examine the Indo-European roots of the sovereignty goddess, uh, to compare her with other goddesses. Uh, and did I say she grants the king the right to rule? And she does that by um, uh, sleeping with him or giving him a drink of mead. And uh, so we're going to read about some of these uh, adventuresome women and we're going to look at the laws of Ireland. We're going to look at kingship and uh, oh yeah. And the other thing is I want us to examine the oral tale. And what I would like to do is anyone who's taking the class, if they would like to tell a story that we'll be reading in their own words very briefly. And I think that could be really a good introduction. You know, we're so used to seeing things on screens, movies, televisions, our computers. So I think it might be interesting to hear a person tell the story in their own word. And that's totally voluntary. So Wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. That sounds like an, another fascinating class. Thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have Carl Goodman. Let me see, where is he? There he is. Um, and he um, is teaching a class on called Trading with the Enemy. It's about a, a, a tale of diamonds and oil and, and the German military in World War II, and um, specifically about a case called Von Clem versus Smith, which it turned out he actually tried for the government and it was his very first trial. He's best known for his terrific courses on Japan. He is an adjunct professor of Japan, United States Comparative Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Um, he's been a visiting professor at University of Washington in Seattle, Temple University's Tokyo University. Um, he's a retired partner from the international law firm of Jones Day and a life member of the American Law Institute. And he's joining us today from warm, sunny North Carolina. The Trading with the Enemy Act is a statute which is designed to assist the United States in carrying out economic warfare. Um, and it played a significant role in the Second World War, in part because uh, Germany, while a very powerful country, was short of certain products that are needed to maintain a, uh, a 20th century or 21st century war. Uh, among those products are oil, which is needed, of course, to make petroleum so that airplanes can fly, so that tanks can rumble, and so on. Uh, another is diamonds. 
uh, not the kind of diamonds that, uh, that you wear uh, as jewelry, but diamonds that are used in industrial purposes. Um, we, we don't think about the importance of mass production to, to making war. Uh, but as the prints behind me show, uh, I have some interest in Japan and it struck me as quite interesting when I discovered that the equivalent of the Japan Society or Japan American Society was meeting um, on the day that the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor was made public. And um, uh, it is reported that people at that meeting believe that this was fake news in an era when fake news really was fake news. And um, they thought it was fake news because they knew that Japan could not possibly win a long drawn out war against the United States because it didn't have the resources, the natural resources like oil, for example, to, to be successful in a war against the United States. And many of the members at that meeting just kind of threw that off. And Germany had a similar problem. Germany doesn't have oil production of its own. It got most of its oil from its ally, Romania. Uh, prior to the war, it built up oil reserves. Um, and Mr. Von Klemm was involved in that activity was perfectly legal, perfectly lawful activity. Um, under the Trading with the Enemy Act, when we are at war with another country, the United States government can seize, take possession and title to property that it believes is enemy property. Um, people who are not, quote, enemies, as defined in the Trading with the Enemy Act, can bring an administrative proceeding or a judicial proceeding, and in some cases both, to try and recover that property back. To get the property, they have to show that they were a non-enemy and that they own the property. Von Klemm versus Smith, I have on good authority, is probably the only Second World War trading with the Enemy Act case in which an American citizen resident in the United States throughout the entirety of the war was found ineligible to recover property because he was an enemy agent while he was here in the United States. Um, and the, the, the course will deal with the functions of the trading with the Enemy Act and how those functions played into the Von Klemm case and what Von Klemm was doing that, that related to them. Um, for example, um, shortly after the invasion of Belgium and the Netherlands, the German army established a diamond control in Antwerp the function of which was to confiscate diamonds from the diamond merchants of Belgium, Belgium and Holland being the diamond centers of the world. Uh, they wanted those diamonds not because they thought they were pretty um, or could adorn you know, people's fingers. They wanted those diamonds because those gemstone diamonds can be sold for hard currency, which can be used to buy industrial diamonds in the Fourminiere. And industrial diamonds are essential for mass production of military equipment because the military equipment has to last a long time and must be made of very hard materials. And to cut those hard materials, you need a, a hard surface and diamonds provide that. And so, the course will discuss how the Trading with the Enemy Act played a role in the Second World War 
and indeed played a role in the United States before we even entered the war because President Roosevelt used it as a means for aiding uh, our ally, the United Kingdom, and also for protecting people in Belgium, Holland, and other countries by preventing the Germans from trading with them. Um, it will also go into um, how a trial is put together, uh, especially a trial where you have witnesses predominantly in Europe um, and, and facts that people don't want to relive because of the role they played in them. Uh, for example, um, uh, we took the testimony in Germany of the German major who was the head of the diamond control. Um, we'll discuss how it was we managed to take that testimony at the trial when nobody had taken his testimony in the, what, decade in which the administrative case that preceded the trial took place. So it's a way of seeing how trials are put together in a particularly interesting area and how a law like the Trading with the Enemy Act uh, has a role both in peacetime and in wartime. And I think, uh, I think people will find find it interesting and the setting for the trial, I think will help them better understand trials in the future. Thank you so much, Carl. <clears throat> that sounds like a really fascinating class on a really uh, kind of hidden part of the history of World War II and beyond. Um, looking forward to it. Um, next, we were going to have Naomi Spatz, but because we are in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, in the half hour or so since we got started, her power went out. So we're hoping she'll join us again, but perhaps not. Meanwhile, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Michael Forbes Wilcox, who is curating and moderating a class called Indigenous Voices. He's been an all instructor for several years now, offering courses on autism, local history, and indigenous culture. He's a chartered financial analyst and holds an MA in economics from Trinity College. As a disability rights advocate, he has served on many boards and commissions and is currently the town moderator in Alfred. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Megan. Here I will begin as I do in each Ali class with an acknowledgement that I'm speaking to you from the ancestral homelands of the Mahikaniak. In their language, that name means the people of the waters that are never still. A reference to the waters of the tidal basin that they call the Mohikanituk, which is also known as the Hudson River. That name, by the way, by, was shortened by the English and the Dutch colonists. They couldn't, guess, I guess, get their mouths around Mohikoniok, so they used the word Mohican. Anyway, the Mohikoniok lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. Their homeland includes areas on both sides of the river and reached all the way from upper Manhattan north to the shores of Patabagak, which is their word for double lakes, also known now as Lake Champlain and Lake George. So in, the, in that area, their homeland included all of what is now Berkshire County. So please join with me in acknowledging and thanking the Mohikoniak who retain an active interest in and a fondness for their ancestral homeland. On our behalf, I say to them, Onewa, which is the Mohican word for thank you, and Anushik, which is the Munsee word. Also in Abenaki, the expression for thank you is Uliuni, which literally means it's all good. Okay, what you've just heard is a, is a short, shortened excerpt of a longer two page description that I will use in the course. I don't read the whole thing every time, uh, only those parts of it that are pertinent to what we're gonna be discussing that day. 
the full version, of course, is on my website, and I'll provide a, a link for that. Now, you, you heard that the course is, uh, I have titled Indigenous Voices. And as that suggests, what I have done is invited a number, a number of Native American speakers. And you will hear them in their own words talking about things that are important to them. I don't want to oversell the, that aspect of the course because not all of it will be 100% real-time presentations by indigenous speakers. I, I have lined up several live speakers, but I will also be using some video clips. Uh, I won't play the entire recordings of these things. They're fairly long, but I want to give you a, enough of a sample so that if you, and I'll give you the links to the full video. If you find them interesting, you can go and, and, and see them for yourself, see the whole thing. Uh, but I will be showing excerpts from them. And then I will making some commentary. And I hope along the way that the members of the class will participate by asking questions of me or the speakers, and also by making observations and giving opinions. I mean, I, I, the thing I love about Ali is the interactive nature of most of the courses. It's really a, a, a great thing to be an instructor and, and actually learn from the students as, as much as the other way around, I think. Anyway, in these, uh, there will be six sessions of this course, and two of them will feature the recordings that I just mentioned. Uh, and, and as I say, with interruptions from, from me and, and hopefully from the students as well. Uh, two of the other sessions will be panel discussions and there'll be various topics uh, such as uh, indigenous place names that you, you will, that you are familiar with around this area or maybe you're not familiar with and maybe should be, uh, what they mean, where they came from and why we should maybe use them more often. And another, another panel I hope uh, will, will be about traditional medicine and, and other, uh, other cultural aspects of the indigenous culture that thrived on this land for those thousands of years and still persists uh, in, in the case of the Mohicans, they are out in, they're headquartered out in Wisconsin, but they still carry on a lot of the traditions that were, that were used here. So in addition to all of that, the great, uh, I'm very pleased to, to have two full length presentations, live presentations by Abenaki speakers. And I think you will find them absolutely enchanting. Uh, by the way, the Abenaki, and I use the, the Abenaki pronunciation, that is their pronunciation. You may be familiar with the term uh, as Abenaki. That's the English pronunciation. And that's perfectly okay. Um, there won't be any misunderstanding if you use that, but they do, they do it, say it, Abenaki. So anyway, the Abenaki homelands are to our north. And although there are parts of it are in, Mass in Northern Massachusetts, most of the Abenaki homelands are in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and up into Canada. So one, one of these speakers, one of these Abenaki speakers is uh, Cheryl Savageau who is a poet and a writer, and she will read some of her poetry and also discuss one of her, at least one of her books that has dealt with the land use issues. Another one, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to this, is Jesse Bruchak, who is my Abenaki language teacher. Yes, I've been taking, taking classes and it's a lot of fun. And he is also a talented musician and a great storyteller. And, and again, I am not, I have not told these people what, I have not prescribed what they need to talk about. They will talk about whatever is on their mind at the time. And I'm hoping that Jesse will tell one of his stories because he's really good at it. Since I mentioned Vermont as part of the Abenaki homeland, I, let me drop the name of one other speaker who is actually not indigenous, but who is a strong ally and advocate. His name is Brian Cena, and he's a member of the Vermont legislature. He is also happens to be a talented musician and I'm hoping that he will sing for us and play the drum and the flute perhaps. But in any case, one of the thing that he wants to talk about is the idea of place names in Vermont and the, his attempt 
within the legislature to examine the use of place names and to bring them back and, and use them where they where they used to be in state parks and and, and other other suitable places. So I think that'll be that'll be an interesting contribution, and we'll have other similar people like that who are who will, mostly who are indigenous, but not necessarily all of them, but talking about the the indigenous issues. So the, the, the first class I will start out with some video clips featuring the Stockbridge Muncie community, which uh, many of you know the, the story of the Stockbridge Indians and they are now the ones who are in Wisconsin and call themselves a, the Stockbridge Muncie community, a band of the Mohican nation. So on, on the clip that I have, on the, some of the clips I have there uh, features Bonnie Hartley who is the cultural preservation manager of the tribe. And she and my brother Rick did a lot of research that went into some of the other presentations that are on the video, other videos that I will show that talk about the history of Stockbridge and, uh, and other things. So as it happens, Bonnie's grandmother and my brother's grandmother were, were very close friends. So I do have a family connection with the, with the Stockbridge Indians. There's a lot more. Uh, but I hope I have given you a flavor of what, what we will what we will be exploring. So Anewa, Anushik, Uni Uni, I hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much for putting that together. Oh, and uh, um, our next speaker is Catherine Kidd, and she just told me that I believe it's her daughter or daughter-in-law is in labor, so. <laughs> She, she's a little distracted right now, but she, she's a trooper and we're so happy she's here. Um, Catherine Kidd is a, uh, a frequent and uh, beloved Ollie instructor as well. She's taught a variety of highly regarded classes on a wide variety of subjects, including gender parity and politics, contemporary Russia, immigration policy, the 20th century philosopher, philosopher Hannah Arendt, and, and more, more than that even. Um, and she is also Ollie's, uh, the chair of Ollie's University Day Committee. We um, uh, put together a University Day on the women's right to vote about a year ago. Um, that was supposed to happen in April and then the pandemic hit and we weren't able to. So what we've done is transform it into a class uh, with a different speaker, again, another class, which is, um, I love these classes where that are curated and have different speakers each week and I'll let Kate tell you more about it. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, and uh, this is, um, I think, going to be a very, very interesting class. And uh, it is supported by the Mass Humanities uh, Organization, which means that we can offer it for free. Uh, so uh, please note that uh, it doesn't count against um, your registration. And it's also free and open to uh, friends or family members who live outside of the Berkshires uh, so if you have a friend who you think might be interested, this is a great chance for them to get introduced uh, to an Ollie class. Um, I'm just going to run through um, our speakers uh, very quickly. Um, Tom Garrity, many of you may know him from his course on constitutional law and the course he just uh, finished on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, he um, has a PhD from Yale University, uh, but also a law degree uh, and uh, was the uh, director of the Brennan Center uh, at NYU. Uh, so he comes to us with a lot of um, background on issues around the Constitution. And although we talk about the right to vote um, now, uh, and that is the way we conceive of voting. But uh, one reason why there needed to be a suffrage movement and a 19th Amendment was because in the 19th century, there was no such thing as a right to vote. Voting was a privilege. So Tom will be digging into how that uh, way we think about voting has been transformed over the years. Uh, our second speaker is Barbara Berenson, uh, who wrote a book that was published in 2019 
about um, Massachusetts as a center of um, the suffrage movement. Uh, she is also a lawyer uh, on the staff of the Massachusetts um, Supreme Court. And um, she, her book is very important because many of the ways we think about the suffrage movement was centered on New York uh, because um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote the history. And so they got to tell the story their way and that left out many of the really important suffrage leaders, both African-American and white uh, in Massachusetts. And so Barbara uh, highlights their uh, work. Rebecca Edwards is a professor of history at Vassar College. And um, she has done work on suffrage uh, during the Gilded Age and of course the Berkshires uh, were an important center for uh, Gilded Age leaders. Uh, Rebecca was so concerned about issues about the right to vote and about the role of women in politics after 2016 that she ran for county commission in Dutchess County. And so she is not only um, a scholar, a teacher, but she is also currently um, an elected political leader um, in her home county in New York State. Lauren Santangelo is an instructor at Princeton University in the Princeton Writing Program. And uh, in uh, 2019, she published a very highly regarded uh, study of the suffrage movement uh, in New York City. And although uh, Lauren will be giving us a lecture she will also be having us analyzing maps and analyzing photographs uh, of um, suffrage activities in the early part of the 20th century in New York City to understand how uh, women um, changed the geography of New York and how people thought of the geography, especially of Manhattan. Um, our um, next uh, set of speakers are Liv Cummins and Rob Hartman, and they are partners uh, in uh, creating a new musical theater. Uh, Liv is also a, a resident of the Berkshires and is um, a professor of theater at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and they have written a play about suffrage, which was supposed to be performed last year. Uh, but because all of our theaters went dark, uh, that didn't happen. But they have incorporated uh, real suffrage songs uh, into um, this play that they have written. And uh, this will also be a time when the class will break up into small groups and will actually uh, analyze the uh, language and the music that was being used to promote suffrage. As we know, music, protest music has always been important and that was definitely true in the suffrage movement. Uh, Kathleen Cahill is a professor of history at Penn State University and uh, she published a new book uh, in 2020, um, Raising Up the work of Native American women, Asian American women, African American women uh, in, the, in the suffrage movement and her uh, scholarship is really reshaping um, the way we think about uh, the roles of those women, most of whom didn't get the right to vote after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and our uh, class will be closed out by Robin Rosen, uh, who is our humanities uh, scholar for this project. She's a professor of women's history at Marist College, and we'll be looking at the unfinished business of suffrage. Um, I also want to add that uh, in preparing for the University Day, our colleague John Dixon uh, who is an Ali member and instructor. Uh, and I and a student from Miss Hall's uh, did some research on local um, suffrage activities. And uh, that um, material will be available to people who will be taking the class also. Uh, so Megan, anything else we need to add? 
Uh, no, that sound, it sounds wonderful. It's an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, and thanks to Mass Humanities and their grant, this class is completely free and open to anyone with a Wi-Fi connection. And um, we will, uh, and you don't need to be a member. Um, I put the link in the chat and um, best wishes on your new grandchild. Thank you. Well, I mean, we hope she gets born today. <laughs> She's a little overdue. Thank oh, you. okay. Well, I'll be wishing for that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And it's it's an exciting uh, open house today. <laughs> so, um, uh, next up, I'm delighted to welcome Ralph Pearson. For, Ralph will forever be known to me as the man who drove down from his mountain home in Savoy, and he is now truly a mountain man, thanks to his pandemic um, uh, beard, drove down and taught a class from the parking lot of MCLA when it was still pretty cold um, because to use their Wi-Fi because he, he is in a place without broadband, which is a whole other issue that we are um, have an upcoming event about. Uh, Ralph received a master's degree, degree from Cornell in hotel administration. Um, he's led tours worldwide and personally traveled to sites where the artists he'll talk about painted as well as museums with the uh, landscape collections. A native of the upper Hudson Valley, his passion for landscape art was formed early as he hiked and paddled the same woods and streams as did the artists. He is blissfully retired and enjoyed previous careers as an keeper, travel agent, and tour manager. Take it away, Ralph. Thank you very much, Megan. It's it's nice to be back. Um, I'm I'm in a, a different location now. I'm coming to you from not Lake George, which is behind me, but um, from a room in uh, the community college where it's a whole lot better than speaking from my car as I did. That first course, uh, which was in the spring, uh, covered the art and artist of the Hudson River School. And we focused on the beginning of the Hudson River School. So in a sense, this course picks up where that led off, left off and takes it from there. Uh, it's entitled Luminism and Beyond Currents in Landscape Art, 1850 to 1914. And 1914 on the eve of World War I is when a very important group of artists was uh, started in Canada. The, the group of seven, uh, they coalesced before World War I and following the war, they really came together and had a lot to do with the development of a national cultural identity in Canada, much like the Hudson River School artists did here in the United States, roughly three quarters of a century before. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a parallel story in some ways. So we're gonna be talking about that um, formation of a natural, national identity and what that means. And I'm, I'm a big fan of the uh, early modernism period. And these, this group of seven that we're leading to with this course, we're gonna arrive there uh, in the, the sixth week. I'll give a little preview of that group since uh, there's probably a little suspense since I'm focusing on them uh, and not too many people are aware of them, I suppose. That, that's rather typical here in the United States. And I'm, I'm so enthralled by them that in the summer, in a separate course, I'll be teaching uh, a course in, in the group of seven and their associates. So uh, we'll end the suspense in the first of these six classes, which will be taking place on uh, Thursday uh, at 11.30. I see that I'm between the real estate investing course and the cooking class. I think we'll hear more about those. So in the morning, you can pick out your new home. In the afternoon, you can start cooking in it. And in between with me about noontime, you can pick out the art that you're gonna hang on the walls while you're getting all that together. Um, we're gonna take a look at the Hudson River School, the, the second generation. Um, you may recall, or you may be aware that Thomas Cole, the founder of the school, and uh, Usher Durand were considered the first generation. But by 1850, numerous other painters uh, were leading the, uh, the way towards a luminist approach. And luminism is marked by a very simplicity of form. In a certain sense, it's a precursor to abstract movements that would come later. Uh, there's uh, meticulous realism. There's a, a real clarity uh, of tone 
and uh, the gradations in tone, like, like if you can see behind me off as, as you're looking at the screen to the left, you can see how that water is painted there. Uh, that's very different. Uh, you, you see very subtle gradations. Uh, it, it's relatively a flat painting. And this contrasts with what we're going to be seeing in the ensuing decades as we make our way towards this group of seven on the eve of World War I. We're going to be looking at um, other groups, among them um, more or less in order, the, the Barbizon, the French Barbizon School, um, then the, the Tonalists, Impressionism, and then uh, Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, which was a, a spin-off that was very, very colorful. And um, we'll divide that part of the class, so to speak, into the Hudson River and Luminism portion that takes about the first two weeks. Then we'll go on to these intermediate movements that I just uh, mentioned for the next couple of weeks. And in the fifth and sixth classes, we're going to be dealing with the issue of national identity, not just how the group of seven and their associates uh, helped form that in Canada, but also in the, the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, which were going through some, some major changes during that period, geopolitical changes that were reflected in the lifestyle and the art. And along the way, we're going to see how the, the Hudson River School artist, which was uh, very much stressed the close observation of nature and the primacy of the American landscape, how there were parallels in the Nordic countries and Canada, and uh, what, what uh, was maintained through all of that was uh, an abiding interest and a belief in, in nature's uh, innate spirituality. That sounds amazing, Ralph. Thank you so much. Okay. And thank you for making the effort to come to BCC to uh, to do the, the um, open house today. One last, uh, just a quick comment. There's going to be lots of DVDs and video clips uh, along with my commentary. Fabulous. Thank you. Much. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Wonderful. Up next, uh, as um, Ralph mentioned we have Anna Gershenson. This is the first time that she's teaching for us and we hope she'll teach many more times. Um, she is a fabulous uh, chef, a caterer. Uh, she's hosted a cooking show called The Natural Cook. And where did she go? Did she disappear for everybody? And we seem to be having interesting things happening. Oh, Somehow she got bumped. Let's bump her back. Um, she uh, was born in Latvia. She has a charming um, and beautiful accent. She's a recipe tester for the Wall Street Journal. She, she holds a master's in English language and literature and won the Pittsfield Community Television Award for quality in programming uh, for her show, The Natural Cook. And we're so delighted to have her here and have her teaching for Ollie for the first time. And welcome and don't forget to unmute yourself. Hello. I am really honored to be in this wonderful group of such distinguished um, teachers and presenters. I am humbled because um, they, they have described their curriculum and it's really exciting and it's food for the soul and for the brain. And what I'm offering is going to be food for the body. Um, I come from very humble roots in cooking. I was fascinated with cooking as a child, growing in a communal apartment and um, with my parents working, but nevertheless, always having homemade meals on the table. And I was always hanging out in the kitchen wanting to help my mother. And there were always meals on the table, homemade meals. And besides, we were always eating locally and seasonally because I was growing up in the Soviet Union, <laughs> which is Latvia now, and where food was um, fairly scarce. So there were no preservatives added to food. It was disappearing very quickly. So first of all, um, I want to let you know that um, I will be teaching. My classes will be on April 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. It will be a four session course. 
it will be one and a half hour class uh, from 1.30 to 3 o'clock. And I will be cooking on camera, but I won't be just cooking. If anybody, if anybody who is watching now is familiar with my cooking show, uh, as I cook, I talk about food, I talk about the history of food, about its intrinsic nutritional qualities, about what it does for your body and why it is important to eat uh, seasonally and locally. And um, I guess home cooking was never really something that people were excited about. And uh, every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> and all of a sudden, home cooking became the focus. And everybody is learning how to make sourdough and how to bake challah and, uh, and excited about it and really digging deep into the basics. So I know that I'm addressing mature audience and I don't know who has what level and knowledge of cooking and who is excited about it and who is not. And I'm hoping that my classes will ignite your interest, will make you comfortable being in the kitchen because um, I love what I do. And I hope that my love will um, exponentially propagate into your homes and make you excited. And so I, I, want to, I want you to know that every time there will be a menu that is going to be seasonal and uh, also um, making use of local ingredients. We have wonderful farms. We are so fortunate uh, living in the Berkshires. And uh, on my show, I was introducing different farmers and producers and people who work for the community uh, on issues of having access to food. And so um, I think that um, I, I really need to share with you at this, at this time that it was the Peacefield community that I moved into that inspired me to create my cooking show and to share my knowledge and my passion. That and is so, wonderful. Yes, and I believe that I am really honored to be the first person to, in, to offer a cooking course. And um, welcome. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anna. And I especially, I especially love that um, you'll be focusing on spring, seasonal spring ingredients, whether um, it be lamb or it be, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're like leeks. So many good things in the Berkshires. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, because um, we're running out of time, I'm going to introduce Alan Rubin. Alan's taught a variety of classes for Ollie, including most recently Women's Spies and Code Breakers. He owned and operated an independent retail business in New York, New York City. For four decades, that was chronicled in his daughter's daughter Jen Rubin's book, We Are Staying 80 Years in the Life of a Family, a Store, and a Neighborhood. Uh, the class he'll be teaching this spring is on the history of the FBI, and it will be on Tuesdays. Alan, take it away. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, I'm looking forward to sort of uh, rounding out uh, the third course in the series that I've done on the, the, the CIA and also on uh, espionage and coding. Uh, it's interesting because the CIA is basically 100 years old now. It started in uh, 1919 and 1920 with the, as a result of the Palmer raids and uh, the beginning of the Red Scare. And uh, Hoover, at the age of 24, took over. Uh, he took an agency that had a lot of undesirable types as their agent. He got rid of them all. He put in uh, rigid uh, uh, codes of con conduct. But as I said, it's about 100 years old, and you can break it down into two 50-year periods, 50 years under Hoover and 50 years since Hoover. Is the FBI different today, uh, post-Hoover? Uh, I'm going to go into um, uh, how uh, presidents uh, interacted with the head of the FBI. Uh, Hoover basically uh, felt that he was the one controlling presidents. 
uh, uh, our uh, recent president felt that the FBI should be beholden to him. And uh, that uh, came under a uh, conflict he had with uh, James Comey and Andrew uh, McCabe. And so uh, the way I'll do the course is I like to uh, have a lot of interaction. Uh, I will be sending out uh, uh, some uh, videos and some uh, reading material. Uh, I prefer that you come into the class with sort of an understanding of what we're going to discuss so uh, that we can have more of an interactive uh, dialogue on it. There are several members in the Ali community that have backgrounds that complement what we're going to be talking about. So they'll be called on to help. And in a nutshell, that, that's what it's going to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alan. That sounds like a great class. We're almost at the end. Um, I now would like to introduce Phil Dealey. Phil um, has taught several wonderful classes for Ollie with an array of special guests, very special guests, and has also taught at Simon's Rock in Phillips Exeter. He holds an undergraduate degree in history from Hobart College and a master's degree from the University of Chicago. His course is entitled Glory and grandeur, ancient Greece and Rome, and will be held on Wednesday mornings. Welcome, Phil. Great. Thank you, Megan. I, I was going to uh, announce that having uh, listened to all of my predecessors, I've decided to cancel my course and simply <laughs> spend all of my time uh, att attending these, uh, these other courses. And uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, since we're going to be talking about uh, Greece and Rome, and in, indeed about uh, Troy and the Celts, that uh, uh, Richard Maturo and Susan Wozniak's uh, topics are very much uh, uh, apropos or linked uh, to what it is that we're going to be talking about uh, as, as we take a um, 30,000 foot uh, look at the classical world of, of Greece and Rome. Uh, it would be ambitious enough to do the classical world of Greece or the classical world of Rome, but to do the two together uh, takes a special type of hubris, as the <laughs> Greeks as the Greeks would say. Uh, the course itself uh, is designed to uh, give people an opportunity uh, to both uh, revisit or visit for the first time uh, the worlds that they may have learned about uh, in their uh, primary school education, uh, the, the world of myth, the world of uh, Caesars and triumphs and conquests and all the rest of it. Uh, but it's also designed to give a sense of uh, the breadth and depth of the uh, the breadth and depth of, of the topics. Uh, like a number of my other colleagues, um, I too like to use uh, visitors to the class uh, to give uh, some uh, interaction uh, and to um, also uh, uh, make sure that it's not just my voice opining for the uh, for the hour and a half. Um, Dr. Nicole Brown, uh, who is a, a professor of classics at Williams, will be joining us. And uh, I've, I've reached an age where I can say I, I first knew Nicole Brown when she was in the playground playing with my son. Uh, subsequently, uh, as I discovered recently, she went on to Princeton and got a PhD in classics. Uh, and so uh, uh, comes to us in a, in, in a very different, uh, a very different uh, capacity. Uh, Walton Wilson uh, will be joining us. He's the chair of Yale's uh, acting school. Uh, and uh, Walton and I will be talking about uh, Greek drama, uh, its roots and origins, uh, how it is interpreted today. And Walton being uh, quite a well-known uh, actor uh, will no doubt uh, uh, regale us with, with certain highlights of, of Greek drama. And uh, for those of you with the visual sense, David McCauley, uh, the well-known illustrator, uh, will be returning. David did a book in 1974 called Rome, in which he illustrated and discussed the Roman uh, building techniques and gives us a sense of how that, uh, how that empire expanded. Uh, one of the key elements of the course uh, will be 
um, looking at the connections between the classical world and, and the world of today. Uh, as we endure a pandemic, uh, we may be reminded that pandemos uh, means uh, everybody across the world uh, with its Greek origins. And so uh, everything from uh, language to politics to uh, literature uh, will be uh, fair game uh, for, this, uh, for this seminar. Uh, I can attest to the fact that, that this seminar does have some, some legs and connection because uh, I've noted that two of my former students from the 1970s uh, have re-enrolled in the class. Uh, I suppose to catch up on anything they may have uh, uh, missed before. And um, it, it should be uh, a class I think of, of some, some, some great interest. I might just add with a, uh, a point that the classics themselves are a very uh, fraught uh, area, particularly today. And some of you may have read uh, in the New York Times, there was a uh, magazine, uh, there was a interesting article about Daniel uh, Padilla Peralta, uh, who is a professor at Princeton uh, in the classics department, who said upon review uh, that the classics uh, should be uh, uh, totally dismantled. Uh, classics professors uh, should be assigned to other disciplines and the classics um, uh, department itself should be discontinued. His argument, he goes on to say, is because the history of the classics, the history of Greek and Rome, uh, is the story of two civilizations built on slavery and repression. Uh, and he has a very strongly articulated and very controversial uh, view towards the classics. So uh, uh, th this won't be your regular uh, Ovid, uh, Caesar, and Cato. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the uh, uh, cutting edge ideas uh, as people look at the ideology and the nature of the classics. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the advances in archeology, span which have really changed our view of uh, the ancient world and how it operated. Uh, lots more to talk about, but uh, I, th I think that should at least give you a flavor. Uh, hope you'll be there on Wednesday mornings, uh, starting on March 24th, uh, and uh, we'll be going at it from 9.30 to 11. Wonderful, thank you so much, Phil. That, uh... Like everything we've talked about today, that sounds amazing. Susan Wozniak says, I want to take every class. And um, now uh, we're just uh, winding up to uh, five o'clock. Naomi Spatz, who is an instructor um, whose power went out halfway through this uh, session, is calling in. I'm going to hit allow to talk so she can tell us a little bit about her um, class. Naomi, are you there? Whoops. Asked to unmute. Naomi, oh, it looks like she's not there. Um, but that class, by the way, is the um, at annual class we do. It's the Berkshire Performing Arts. Hello. Ah, oh, there she is. I'm Hello, here. Naomi, how are I'm you? I'm here. Uh, you uh, I'm good, but I don't, it's like. I'd like to warn all of you, not, don't show too many DVDs or things because technology. I was watching everybody and then all of a sudden it froze and went off. I've lost power. Um, I might need a warm bed tonight. So uh, if my friends are listening, I'll be very quick because I know you have to close down. Um, so um, I'm Naomi Spass. for several years now, I've been doing the uh, Berkshire previews. Um, and unfortunately, my dear friend and co-host Nancy Vale died on the day that Andy gave me the dates for our new course, um, and she'll be missed, and it was a shock. And Barbara Waldinger, who's part of my performing our performing arts initiative, will has graciously agreed to co-host. So um, what this class is is that what we do is we light all the important or significant artistic directors in this area in the Berkshires of the platforms. And for years, they have come and happily come to talk about their season. Um, and we've had a very good audience for them. They love Ollie. I'll, as proof, 
I sent out that day that Nancy died and Andy gave me the dates. I sent out invitations a few days later. I couldn't do it that day because I was too much in shock. And within a day, all of them said, yes, yes, yes. Even though they know that uh, the season is a bit crazy and they don't know what it is, but um, they will tell you. And let me just give you a brief idea. Um, the class starts on April 2nd at 1.30. What I have done is divide each class into 45-minute segments. So we will have two artistic directors on each day. So they will talk for 20, 30 minutes and have a chance for questions as well. So it starts out on April 2nd. We've got Barrington Stage and Berkshire Theatre Group. Those two women, Julianne Boyd and Kate McGuire, are absolutely amazing. They were the first two artistic directors in the country to put on plays uh, during the uh, virus. They got Actors' Equity and they just moved on beautifully. The next week, we're going to have Williamstown Theatre Festival. Laura Savio, who's just wonderful, has been with us before. And of course, Alan Burroughs of Shakespeare and Company, whom I hope you all know. If not, please do. Um, and then the following week, we've got Jacob's Pillow and Pam Tadjay is coming and she had that terrible thing this year a small theater burned down and she will be talking about what they're going to do. Each one of them has projects. Um, and also on that day, it's uh, Daniel Kramer from the Chester theater company. He has already figured out how to do it. He's putting on productions under a tent at Hancock village. Um, the following week on April 23rd, for the first time, we'll have Bridge Street Theatre. Um, the reason we wanted you to know about them is because they give productions all year, and some of us have spent more this year up here than we had planned to. I've been here for a year now. Um, and then we also will have the Berkshire Opera Festival. Um, they're going to be putting on Glory Denied, and we'll have the conductor, Jeffrey Larson, and the executive director, Abigail Rollins. And then for the final, on April 30th, what I've done is that wonderful critics panel, which we used to do at the beginning, but I put it at the end in the hopes that schedules are clear and that they will have more to talk about. But that will be with Peter Bergman, Jeff Borak, Dan Dwyer, Macy Levin, Gloria Miller, and of course, our own dear uh, Barbara Waldinger. Um, so that's the way the course is and things might change. I mean, last time we had it, that was when Alan Burroughs announced that he was having drive-ins. So we will be at the cutting edge of whatever they're doing. Um, one last note is if you are theater people, the Irish rep has been putting on plays on YouTube. Go online and find them. They're putting them on for free. There were donations suggested. I saw a touch of the poet and they're having a few more. This is the last week of it. And I suggest, uh, um, you look at it. Um, Daniel Kramer had done some of that uh, this year. He would cite a play that was on and have a discussion. So that's all I have to, to say on this. Um, I look forward to seeing you. If there are any questions, um, please let me know. And uh, please guard your technology and <laughs> also pray for pray for pray for a season the artistic <laughs> directors were so enthusiastic and they're praying and i hope they're going to bring it off wonderful thank, thank you, you so thank much, you megan Naomi. you are a super trooper um that concludes <laughs> our program today if you haven't registered for spring classes yet you can do so now on our website or by calling actually you should call tomorrow because we're at the end of the day um if you're already registered for classes and you want to add another class which is very common you will want to give us a call because you can do it on the website the number is 413-236 2190. And for those who aren't in the Berkshires, by attending the Berkshire Performing Arts Previews, you'll want to move to the Berkshires or at least come visit us once it's safe for you. So thank you all. Good night. And uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.